The G20 is about to start in Hamburg with this year's special interest in Africa with the compact with Africa. Can you explain what this is, uh, this is about? The Compact with Africa is a special initi initiative introduced by the German government as president of uh, the G20, which is supposed to bring unprecedented foreign finance, international finance, to finance uh, infrastructure development in Africa. Uh, infrastructure in areas such as water, transport, telecommunications, and energy. The idea is that uh, such infrastructure is badly needed by poor, poor people in Africa and that it will improve their lives and it will stimulate economic growth in Africa. At the same time, it offers an opportunity for global business to also grow because it will make profits out of these inf infrastructure investments. And basically, the idea is that it's a win-win situation for all. Clearly, it, will be, it is the case that global uh, finance will gain profits from Africa because this infrastructure is being done on a commercial basis. A lot of it will, uh, at, will involve African users paying user fees, for example, toll roads, uh, water, water prices going up and so on. But for the African side, it means that more impoverishment for African people because the cost of living will go higher. It means also that the African economies become more tightly integrated into the rhythms of global finance and its boom-bust cycles. It can end up with growing debt and it can also end up with growing destabilization because one aspect of the, con the, the such a redistribution, upward redistribution, will mean that there, will be a, there can be a backlash from ordinary people in Africa. Mm. On the other hand, there will be more intense interests of those who are gaining greater control over African resources to, keep to, to, to want to hold it that way. And for those who are promoting the compact, it's a, it's a competitive tool against other competitors such as China and the United States and so on. So either way, I think that in, a, in every respect, I think that is likely also to promote a scramble for African resources, for African markets, and a scramble for creaming off the surpluses from economic growth in Africa at the expense of working people. The, the, the only African country present at the G20 is South Africa. So how is this being negotiated and why would African governments would want to sign up for something like this? Well, as you know, the G20 has given itself the right to coordinate global economic growth uh, in the fallout since the global crisis. And therefore, it is promoting this as part of that growth. And it is promoting this as a way to ensure that African econo economies who have suffered in recent years from the collapse of international raw material prices also regain economic growth. So it's in that case. That they are coming at it because they, so it's seen in this in this uh, a global respect. The actual mechanism for negotiating the compact, although it is a document that came from it's an initiative that came from the German government, they were quickly able to rope in uh, some of the multilateral financial institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank and actually the African Development Bank to endorse and underwrite the program, and uh, it's being negotiated on a bilateral basis with individual African countries. Hmm. For now, there are seven countries which are ca candidates for immediate compacts. These include countries like Rwanda, Ethiopia, Ghana, Senegal, Morocco, Tunisia, and um, I forgot the last, Senegal. Hmm. Okay. And uh, basically, they sign up to three policy frameworks. One is a macro stabilization framework, which is your orthodox, neoliberal, macroeconomic management framework low debts, low deficits, low public expenditure, okay, ensuring that there's automatic currency, uh, 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 autom automatic flows of capital and repatriation of profits, ensuring that domestic currencies don't become too inflated, and ensuring that, you know, private capital makes, uh, is the risks that private capital might encounter in Africa are mitigated. Yeah. So there, there's a risk transfer from the private sector to the public sector, that's one. Two is that there's a business framework which is that the regulatory leeway and the regulatory opportunities that are granted businesses will be advanced even further. For example, if you compare that to what was proposed in the TTIP and the CETA, where a lot of activists in Europe were concerned about the new powers being given to investors, including the powers to sue states, the so-called investor state dispute mechanism, the compact goes even further because it institutionalizes that processes as part of governmental machineries across the compact countries, in each compact country, and those machineries are supposed to actually act proactively, which means they don't even have to wait for an investor to wait, make a complaint. They have to go out there, seek potential sources of difficulty and complaints by investors and correct them before the investor actually 
and this is part of the condition of the, of, of, the, of that uh, of, of, the, of that process. The third dimension of the uh, the the compact is the financial framework, which involves large-scale financial privatization, liberalization, sorry, and it includes the deepening of financial markets and the privatization of pensions. So, in other words, what we are talking about is that risks will be mitigated for transnational capitals. They will pay less tax. They will be given guarantees, guaranteed rates of return. The governments will, will guarantee those rates of return and take on debts and, uh, and uh, other uh, payments in case the, the compact terms are not materializing for the companies. The tax net will be expanded in Africa, which means that poor farmers, poor uh, 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 working people across the economies will pay more tax. But at the same time, pensioners, uh, African pe workers' pensions are being uh, um, uh, allowed to be part of international financial markets which will then become ways of ensuring that that kind of financial activity attracts other investors to, 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 uh, uh, to these infrastructure projects. So there's a, a sense in which, the, very directly, working people are paying twice with their pensions, number one. Number two, with the higher cost of living because they have to pay commercial rates, user, user service charges for these, uh, for, for these infrastructure. Number three, they will be those who pay the debts that governments incur in their name. And European and other multinational companies walk away with Bonanza uh, guaranteed super high profits. Super high because they see it as a new frontier, but super high also because African economies are deemed to be risks, risk, uh, risky uh, in investments. So the compact bends over backwards to ensure that the guaranteed rates of return, risk-free guaranteed rates of return, hmm. are given to these companies, which type of guarantees they won't get in any, any other market. And the justification is that in the end, it's a good thing for Africa because infrastructure that didn't exist will now exist, even if it impoverishes the people who are supposed to be the beneficiaries of that infrastructure. And this is a European initiative. What is the geopolitical angle to this? Because China and the U.S. also have an interest in, in African resources. Yeah. Well, uh, officially, it's a G20 initiative. So hmm. that is, includes China, it includes Japan, it includes India, even Latin American countries like Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, and of course the United States and Canada. Okay. However, just as you said, the big players in Africa to date, in terms of infrastructure and in terms of the, the developments that we're talking about, has been China and the United States. So the United States has always gained, has an upper hand in terms of oil and gas, apart from in the old French colonies, and obviously China is uh, rapidly increasing its presence in Africa. So from that point of view, you, you, the, 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 in practical terms, it is the Europeans who have driven this project, this compact with Africa, especially the German government, in alliance with the French and, and, and so on. And I think that that is where the geopolitical angle comes into it. Europe has felt increasingly frozen out of access to African resources, strategic resources, and African markets, it feels that it's being squeezed out by the United States on one hand and China on the other. And this is a mechanism to ensure that European businesses and European geopolitical interests regain a foothold and mm. advance in, in Africa. And one of the dimensions we can, we can see this is that it is closely correlated with an increasing military presence by European powers in Africa, including Germany and the Netherlands. Okay, Ostensibly in terms of peace building and peacekeeping, ostensibly to address terrorism, ostensibly to support weak and failing states in terms of illicit drugs and illicit, illicit people trafficking and the mig migration uh, 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 problems and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's, it's, it's an ex a ready-made excuse, especially in the, in the wake of the migrant crisis. It's a ready-made excuse for governments like the German government, but also the Dutch government and others working in tandem with, uh, under the rubric of uh, the German G20 presidency to gain a foothold in Africa. Now, the likely outcome is that the greater res scramble for resources and the greater, um, um, you know, uh, soft, uh, the, 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 the fact that Africa offers a soft entry for military presence, foreign mil the extension of foreign military presence by these European powers, means that what you described as a scramble for Africa can only be intensified. And of course, another element in that scramble is the African ruling classes themselves, who obviously would like to take part in the share of the booty that is being generated from whether the infrastructure projects themselves, from the access to international financial markets, from the fact that the, the, pen, the pension funds of their own workforces, their own labor, laboring classes, is now up for grabs. And I think that is going to be a messy, very messy um, 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 uh, uh, future for working people in Africa if they are not able to resist the likely trajectory of this project. Hmm. 
The G20 is not only the site of these kinds of trade talks, but also of massive protesters, uh, demonstrations. Do you have a message for the people taking to the streets in Hamburg? Absolutely. I think that uh, it, it is just it's very right and very correct that people are protesting against the G20 because it has taken advantage of the crisis not to redress the imbalances and inequities and the way in which capitalism is not functioning for the interest of people. It has taken advantage of the crisis to ensure that it has given capital bailouts, to ensure that it promotes austerity across the world, including in Europe, like in Greece and other places, and is now beginning to extend that in a new way in places like Africa. And I think that it's important for us to draw the line. It's important for the protesters to say that what they have managed to, what they have been uh, 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 fighting against in, in terms of TTIP, in terms of CETA, in terms of auster domestic austerity, in terms of racism, which is closely tied to the question of migration, the forefront of this in a condensed way is the G20. And it's important that they take this fight to, 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 the, to the G20 and begin to roll back. One of the things that I read about the, the, the uh, protests in uh, Hamburg is that they, they plan to kettle the G20 leaders. In other words, reverse the tactics that have been used on protesters across Europe, I guess. I think that's a wonderful idea. And in doing so, it becomes, it's important to internationalize the struggle. And the fact that Africa is on the agenda is an important way to show solidarity, not simply with the concerns that uh, Europeans have about austerity, neoliberalism, and uh, uh, in their own continent, uh, all the effects of Trump and so on, but to see that Africa is actually not going to, not going to be a marginal victim. It is going to be in the forefront of the new onslaught that is being waged, and that fighting the, uh, the, the G20 is an important way of showing support for African people and encouraging them to actually step up their own fight. It's also the basis for ensuring that we have the solidarity, we build the solidarity to actually begin to remake wherever we are, our local, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the global system as a whole, through our local actions. Through, through, our, through our presence on the global st stage, offering alternatives, offering a, a, the, the, the vision of a better world, and doing so in an active way through which all of us begin to exert our power. I think it's wonderful that people will be out on the street in Hamburg, and I, I wish I was there, and I'm, I'm sure some of our African comrades will be there, and I think it's an important moment to be able to, to reach out so that we, build, we stop the rot today and build a better tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you.